Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Technology and World Politics course. Um, last week, we discussed um, how uh, 19th century technological advances have led um, to World War I. And World War I and World War II are usually thought of as one single European war divided into two separate periods. So today, what we're going to do is that we're going to see how technological competition um, became highly influential as the world went on from World War I to World War II and from World War II to Cold War. Um, and it's very important to understand that historical progression uh, because ultimately when we are discussing modern technologies like artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, um, we need to know um, how past technological advances have influenced uh, similar processes in um, world history. So when, um, let me go all the way back, it started from uh, the beginning. So today we're going to discuss capitalism, socialism, space, and the atomic bomb, basically um, four uh, concepts and terms that have defined um, the duration of the Cold War. Uh, before that, we really have to understand what the world looked like in 1914. Now, basically, two major structural forces from mid-19th century um, carried over and hugely influenced 20th century. These are industrialization and mass production. Basically, after the advent of the Industrial Revolution, we have uh, a new kind of living, essentially, uh, and a new kind of world. Um, and in that world, we're witnessing a hugely powerful Europe, uh, an emerging United States, and a gradually um, developing uh, Russia that is soon going to be one of the most industrialized countries in the world. And as a result of this industrialization mass production, we're witnessing huge urbanization and vast expansion of cities. So from villages and small towns, there's a huge migration into big cities forming the metropolitan areas that we know of today, like London, Paris, New York, uh, and mass production of goods and mass demand in cities define basic trade relationship, both internationally and domestically. By late 19th century, what we have in the world is the emergence of large metropolitan areas, especially in Europe, that are driving enormous amounts of consumption. So the kind of consumer culture that we see in modern day life basically originates uh, from late 19th century major metropolitan areas in Europe. Uh, more demand for clothing, more demand for different types of clothing, more demand for uh, modern equipment. And all of that demand um, is largely driven by uh, migration from villages to towns, towns to big cities, and also large population increase that becomes uh, a byproduct of that you know, huge uh, population boom. And by late 19th century, we have international competition, uh, hugely intensifying over sources of raw materials uh, that are very important in industrial production, raw materials like rubber, raw materials like coal, iron and steel, and oil in colonies. So, Largely international competition, which is basically driven by European uh, competition over dominance uh, over the world, what we see <clears throat> is that European competition over colonies, over raw materials, Germany, Britain, France, and all other European countries are um, competing to get hold of essential raw materials in the rest of the world and produce uh, modern equipment and mass produce in their homeland and then sell it to market. So international competition is both over um, securing raw materials and also exporting it to new markets. So <clears throat> by 1910, 
the following conflict areas emerge as a result of this trade relationship. One, the Alsace-Lorraine region of Germany and France, which is uh, a coal and steel producing uh, powerhouse in Europe at the time. The English Channel, which is Britain's naval opening to Europe and to the world. Indian Ocean, which basically secures Britain's access to India. Fourth, the Balkans, ethnic tensions that fuel broader international conflict. Fifth, Azerbaijan and Iran, which means oil fields and access to fuel, and the entire Northern Atlantic Ocean. So America's naval access to major markets and Europe's naval access to raw materials. So Northern Atlantic becomes very influential uh, by 1910. And it's useful to remind that NATO is actually the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So there's a, there's a reason why one of the world's largest alliances is named after North Atlantic, because it is the foundation and basis of the trade relationship between the United States and rest of Europe. So what we have here are basically six main conflict areas that uh, emerge uh, by 1910. Uh, 1910. So these conflict areas blow up altogether uh, in 1914 and lead to World War I. Now let's refresh our memory on why World War I started. Possibly the single most pondered question in history, what caused the unbound senseless slaughter that was the First World War? It wasn't, like in World War II, a case of a single belligerent pushing others to take a military stand. It didn't have the moral vindication of resisting a tyrant. Rather, a delicate but toxic balance of structural forces created a dry tinder that was lit by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo. That event precipitated the July Crisis, which saw the major European powers hurtle toward open conflict. The MAIN acronym is often used to analyze the war. Militarism, alliances, imperialism and nationalism. It's simplistic but provides a useful framework. The late 19th century was an era of military competition, particularly between the major European powers. The policy of building a stronger military was judged relative to neighbors, creating a culture of paranoia that heightened the search for alliances. It was fed by the cultural belief that war is good for nations. Germany in particular looked to expand its navy. However, the naval race was never a real contest. The British always maintained naval superiority. But the British obsession with naval dominance was strong. Government rhetoric exaggerated military expansionism. A simple naivety in the potential scale and bloodshed of a European war prevented several governments from checking their aggression. A web of alliances developed in Europe between 1870 and 1914, effectively creating two camps bound by commitments to maintain sovereignty or intervene militarily. The Triple Alliance of 1882 linked Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy. The Triple Entente of 1907 linked France, Britain and Russia. A historic point of conflict between Austria-Hungary and Russia was over their incompatible Balkan interests, and France had a deep suspicion of Germany rooted in their defeat in the 1870 war. The alliance system primarily came about because after 1870, Germany, under Bismarck, set a precedent by playing its neighbors' imperial endeavors off one another in order to maintain a balance of power within Europe. Imperial competition also pushed the countries towards adopting alliances. Colonies were units of exchange that could be bargained without significantly affecting the metropole. They also brought nations who would otherwise not interact into conflict and agreement. For example, the Russo-Japanese War, 1905, over aspirations in China, helped bring the Triple Entente into being. It has been suggested that Germany was motivated by imperial ambitions to invade Belgium and France. Certainly the expansion of the British and French empires, fired by the rise of industrialism and the pursuit of new markets, caused some resentment in Germany and the pursuit of a short, aborted imperial policy in the late 19th century. 
However, the suggestion that Germany wanted to create a European empire in 1914 is not supported by the pre-war rhetoric and strategy. Nationalism was also a new and powerful source of tension in Europe. It was tied to militarism and clashed with the interests of the imperial powers in Europe. Nationalism created new areas of interest over which nations could compete. For example, the Habsburg Empire was a tottering agglomeration of 11 different nationalities, with large Slavic populations in Galicia and the Balkans, whose nationalist aspirations ran counter to imperial cohesion. Nationalism in the Balkans also piqued Russia's historic interest in the region. Indeed, Serbian nationalism created the trigger cause of the conflict, the assassination of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Ferdinand and his wife were murdered in Sarajevo by Gavrilo Princip, a member of the Bosnian-Serbian nationalist terrorist organization the Black Hand Gang. Ferdinand's death, which was interpreted as a product of official Serbian policy, created the July Crisis, a month of diplomatic and governmental miscalculations that saw a domino effect of war declarations initiated. The historical dialogue on this issue is vast and distorted by substantial biases. Vague and undefined schemes of reckless expansion were imputed to the German leadership in the immediate aftermath of the war, with the War Guilt Clause. The notion that Germany was bursting with newfound strength, proud of her abilities and eager to showcase them, was overplayed. The almost laughable rationalisation of British imperial power as necessary or civilising didn't translate to German imperialism, which was aggressive and expansionist. There is an ongoing historical discussion on who, if anyone, was most culpable. Blame has been directed at every single combatant at one point or another, and some have said that all the major governments considered it a golden opportunity for increasing popularity at home. The Schlieffen Plan could be blamed for bringing Britain into the war. The scale of the war could be blamed on Russia as the first big country to mobilise. Inherent rivalries between imperialism and capitalism could be blamed for polarising the combatants. Every point has some merit, but in the end what proved most devastating was the combination of an alliance network with the widespread, misguided belief that war is good for nations and that the best way to fight a modern war was to attack. That the war was inevitable is questionable, but certainly the notion of glorious war of war as good for nation-building was strong pre-1914. By the end of the war, it was dead. So it's really important to understand why World War I um, happened, because it's one of the most influential wars, of course, in recent history, along with World War II. Uh, but also, World War I is so gigantic in nature, was a reason it's called World War, uh, is that the technological advances that were being invented since mid-19th century, like the steam engine, like mass production, um, like flight, like uh, combustion engine, all of these technological advances basically um, rendered all countries um, a bit uh, into an illusion that the you know, modern technology makes them very powerful. Um, all countries felt that they're technologically superior, uh, and that's one of the reasons why all of the countries miscalculated that they would probably win the war. Uh, but of course, World War I is also the maturation of most of the 19th century technologies. Um, most of them related to how human beings used engines. Um, so the first um, development and deployment of a tank, uh, first deployment of a warplane, uh, first uh, deployment of uh, destroyers and dreadnought class battleships that uh, used uh, you know, oil-based uh, combustion engine. All of those basically um, went, could go on display in World War I. Now, what are those? Let's have a survey of them. I think one really clear way of understanding the shift in World War I in terms of technology is that soldiers rode in on horses 
and they left in airplanes. At the beginning of World War I, warfare is almost in the 19th century style. The French sincerely believe that going at the troops with determination at enemy troops is the way to go. What they don't understand is the collision of technologies. General Pershing didn't believe in the trench warfare. He grew up on the plains fighting in Indian warfare where it was an open concentration. So he trained his troops to fight in the open warfare. The British and French generals thought he was crazy. They criticized him for this. It's impossible to cross that deadly beaten zone, the deadly zone between the two lines. The most determined line of soldiers cannot oppose a machine gun that fires hundreds of rounds a minute. World War I wasn't just the first industrial war, it was also the first scientific war. It was the first time that societies had taken all of their resources of science and intelligence and said, how do we do this better? How do we fight better? How do we develop technologies? A lot of the armaments you see in World War I had been used before. Submarines, trench warfare, Gatling guns, machine guns. What happens during World War I is that these become mature and these become even more destructive. During the war, the governments of all the different warring powers put enormous amounts of time and effort into scientific and technical development so that the advancements, which would have happened anyway, happen at a much more rapid pace, and they happen according to the priorities of the warring powers. Something happened in trench warfare that changed the course of the war and changed the way we understand warfare today, and that is chemical warfare. The first gas attack it was at a place called Vimy Ridge, and it was mostly Canadian soldiers who were being attacked. And the Canadian soldiers who were in the trenches saw this cloud of haze coming towards them. They had no gas masks. They had no equipment to protect them. <laughs> Chlorine gas causes your lungs to fill with liquid, and so essentially you drown from the inside out. It was really the first war in which all of the technologies and science and industry of the 19th century were put to the sole purpose of killing people. So yes, I mean, World War I is the first technological war and it's also the first scientific war, uh, just like they mentioned, because War has always been very much intertwined with technology. You know, who, whichever empire controlled the most advanced forms forms of technology always became the most powerful one. But World War One um, really tied the idea of science into the idea of war. Uh, and beginning with World War One, um, we see from 1914 up until 1945, end of World War II, um, an enormous speed at which technologies uh, develop. So we can really say that from 1914 up until 1945, science and technology developed primarily due to the needs of military and war. Um, and this idea becomes even more uh, pronounced in World War II when entire universities, entire research and development uh, groups were connected to uh, weapons programs or basically some kind of military uh, purpose. Possibly the single... Now, by the end of the World War II, you know, 1918, um, we basically have a much different world compared to 1914. The entire world system basically changes. And probably the biggest change that we see um, at the end of World War I is the end of empires. The idea of an empire, which uh, really dominated the last thousand years of human history, probably from uh, 10th century up until 1918, the most efficient, the most powerful form of polity and human organization, the idea of empire, 
it disintegrates because the last limit remaining major imperial powers, the German Empire, Ottoman Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Russian Empire, they disintegrate and collapse. So if we say, you know, who lost World War I, we can say like Germany, yes, Ottoman Empire, but primarily the idea of empire loses World War I. Uh, what we understand at the end of World War I is that empires, the idea of a large nation that is ruled by a hereditary dynastic system in which power is transferred from father to son, father to son, father to son, that doesn't work. At least that doesn't work in terms of controlling science and controlling new technologies. Empires become too slow and empire become, empires become too weak in a way uh, to uh, compete with more modern nation states that are structured on a constitution, that are structured on a parliament, and that are structured on elections at least. So basically representative and more modern democratic governments emerge. Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Palestine, Iraq, Transjordan, Syria. So we basically have around 25 new nations out of the ashes of um, four imperial powers that collapsed. And with the exception of the Soviet Union, most new states emerged as constitutional republics. What does that mean? A constitutional republic is a type of political organization in which a nation has a constitution, which is the ultimate form of law in that country, and their republics, meaning that uh, the political organization is structured in parliaments. We also have constitutional monarchies, such as the United Kingdom, in which you have a king and queen, but they're mainly for um, ceremonial purposes. The decision maker is still the prime minister and the parliament. So we can have constitutional republics and constitutional monarchies, but at the end of the day, we have a constitutional system around the entire Europe. And this means that all the form of one big sultan, one big emperor, one big king controlling an entire country uh, is no longer functioning. So basically, countries adapt to a new political system, which makes science more efficient, uh, trade and industrialization more efficient. And they realize that industrialization, science, and technology cannot happen under a monarchic system, at least an unconstitutional or an, a, a, um, an absolutist monarchy in which the king makes all the decisions. That no longer works. So all of the, I mean, most of the World War, post-World War I countries um, essentially become more representative as far as voting, as far as constitutions, as far as parliaments are concerned. And for the first time, um, we see the creation of the League of Nations. And League of Nations is the precursor uh, to the United Nations that we have today. It was basically established uh, to manage um, the competition between countries and essentially to prevent another world war. Uh, from uh, happening. So what happened after World War I? The war to end all wars is over. And yet, Henry Wilson, British Army Chief of Staff, wrote in 1919, one year and three days later, we have between 20 and 30 wars raging in different parts of the world. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War epilogue special. At the end of 1918, there are new nations and new leaders springing up all over Europe, and the former battlefields of the World War will soon see renewed warfare as those nations fight each other 
or fight themselves in civil wars. A world reeling from the confusion of the World War now grows even more confusing. In Central and Eastern Europe, the idea now is that national identity is based on some mix of ethnicity, geography, and religion. Unfortunately, there are no natural borders on which to base these new divisions. So, no matter how you slice it, a lot of people with any common cultural identity will end up on the wrong side of some border. Move the border a little to fix that, and it's another group that gets split instead. Poland becomes independent again after 123 years of partitions. Czechoslovakia becomes a republic. A Hungarian Democratic Republic is declared. Latvia declares independence from Russia. Montenegro becomes part of Serbia. The Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes is established. Transylvania again becomes part of Romania. In fact, Hungary lost so much territory from the Treaty of Trianon that it had instant grievances against its neighbors, especially Romania, with whom they went to war, and that began a pretty much permanent source of discord. Russia is in a state of civil war. The by now fairly well-organized Bolshevik forces, the Reds, face a mess of different counter-revolutionary factions, the Whites. These imperialists, democrats, proto-fascists, monarchists, and more fight not only against the Reds, but also for control of the war between each other. But beyond the civil war, the Bolsheviks want to take back land lost to Germany under the brest litovs Treaty, most of which is now new European nations. These regions are rich in resources and industry, but also the Bolshevik aim is to achieve the international proletariat. The ideal vision is a world of peace and prosperity where everyone receives according to their needs and gives according to their ability. In 1919, this vision seems ridiculous because all they do is fight and kill. Estonia is fighting Russia mostly united, but Lithuania, Latvia, and Belarus are split into factions that either want to stay independent or want to become part of Russia again. Polish forces are fighting with Ukraine for control over eastern Galicia, which contains Europe's biggest oil reserves. So Ukraine is facing three enemies at once, since they're also fighting with Romania in the south over territories in Bessarabia, recently annexed by Romania, but that now want to join Ukraine instead. Poland is both concerned about having the Bolsheviks on their doorstep and about protecting the ethnic Poles in the region. The Polish-Soviet war soon begins. But wars are not confined to Eastern Europe. The United Kingdom is at war with Ireland, the Afghans, and the Bedouins in Syria. France is at war with Hmong rebels in the War of the Insane in Indochina. Finland is fighting back Bolshevik Russian forces. Despite the Ottoman Empire coming to its end, the War of Turkish Independence pits Turkey against the Allies again, now with Greece as an Allied proxy. Greece got new territory after the World War and then looked at what seemed to be a helpless Ottoman remnant and decided to go to war to reunite all of the lost Hellenic provinces from ancient history. A successful advance led the Greeks all the way to Ankara, but Mustafa Kemal managed to put together an even more successful counteroffensive that overwhelmed the overstretched Greek army. This war and the atrocities committed on both sides shocked even a world that had just been through the World War. The Treaty of Lausanne that ended that conflict also swapped, yep, relocated, the Greek and Turkish minorities on each side with each other against their will, but perhaps even more importantly, it provided a quasi-legal precedent whereby unwanted minorities could be removed from a nation that would really come back to haunt the world over the next decades. There is unrest everywhere. In China, the new republic that deposed the emperor in 1912 is already falling apart. Although the Republic of China still exists officially, in reality, the country is now under control of local warlords. Some parts of China are under Japanese control. Japan is one of the allies and expanded its influence on the Asian mainland and in the Pacific post-war. Together with the US, they are also now involved in eastern Siberia against the Bolsheviks. In India, Southeast Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, France and Britain have tightened their control over their colonial dependencies. Nevertheless, there is increasing civil strife as the peoples of these regions watch new independent nations arise all over the rest of the world. 
In the Middle East, the British have made the Emir Faisal king of Greater Syria, a British dependency. They have also promised him a new pan-Arabic nation. This is a reward for uniting the Arab tribes, together with Lawrence of Arabia, with the allies in the Great War. But the intricate web of financial interest, oil fields, and agreements like Sykes-Picot that divided up the region between France and Great Britain on lines just drawn on a map with no care for the division of peoples, or the Balfour Declaration that promises a Jewish state in Palestine, now stand in the way of a united Arabia. And France and Britain are unwilling to give up their influence and oil. By the time 1920 ends, many of those East European nations proclaimed only a little more than a year ago no longer exist. Ukraine, Lithuania, and Latvia are part of Soviet Russia or Poland. The Bolsheviks defeated and destroyed the white forces, but as they consolidated their gains and with incredible hubris turned their attention westward, first to crush the Poles and take Poland, and then to take Germany and beyond, they were themselves beaten, no, they were slaughtered by the Poles at the Battle of Warsaw, and Soviet influence in mainland Europe was halted for the next 20 years. Poland remained free. Military historian J.F.C. Fuller ranks the Battle of Warsaw as one of the most decisive battles in history as it prevented Soviet influence from reaching the borders of Germany, Romania, and Hungary at what was a very critical and uncertain stage in those nations. And the uncertainty in Germany was reaching a fever pitch. The 1920 Lutwitz Kapp Putsch, a coup to take power that involves former German Army Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff and the Freikorps, right-wing paramilitary nationalist forces, begins. They take Berlin, but as the government flees the city, the entire country, at government request, goes on strike. In Berlin, everything stops. No gas, no water, no electricity, no nothing. In effect, the refusal of the entire German population makes Lutwitz and Kapp incapable of governing, and the coup breaks down after only three days. Though it looks, at first, like a big win for the new Weimar Republic, it won't be in the long run. A major grievance of Kapp and company against the government was that the National Assembly was only supposed to serve temporarily and was now acting like a permanent Reichstag. This is a popular sentiment, so to appease further unrest, the Assembly is dissolved in April and a general election held in June. The electorate is not impressed with the current government. They get half the votes they had gotten in 1919. None of the parties can agree on a coalition with a majority. And the conservatives manage to form a minority government. This effectively leads to a paralysis of government as they can't advance their policies without support of the opposition. In fact, the Weimar Republic will never have a majority government again. And this will contribute to the constant chaos in German politics in the 1920s as the country will have no clear leadership. And that chaos, combined with the failure of the German economy over the years and growing resentment that the war wasn't really lost, but the army was betrayed by its leaders, will prove a fertile breeding ground for extreme political movements like the Nazi party. And in all of the nations I mentioned today, nations at war or civil war in the aftermath of the World War, the 1920s will come to be defined by isms, movements and ideologies across the whole political spectrum, many of which are new or new as mass movements. Fascism, futurism, communism, internationalism, republicanism, feminism, liberalism, nationalism, socialism, pacifism, imperialism, and more. And the struggle between these competing ideologies that are often completely incompatible with each other will define the world of the 1920s, making it as chaotic at times or even more so than the Great War. And the people of this brave new world cannot help but be colored by the specter of violence after seeing and living so much of it for so long that casual violence is an accepted part of society and institutionalized violence is seen by a great many people as an acceptable way to solve a conflict. And it begs the question, if the whole world is at war, then is the world war over? If you'd like to know more about what was- Right, this was a very, very good question, right?
uh, because in 1918, when the World War was over, conflict around the world actually increased because when uh, most of the time from looking at Turkey, after 1918, we had War of National Liberation and from 1923, uh, um, up until 1938, what we have in Turkey is relative stability, right? Like mean, compared to Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, um, new Turkish Republic doesn't see that kind of big violence, uh, but most other Eastern European countries do. And most of the rest of the world actually does quite see a lot of conflict after 1918. So uh, when the World War one ends, there's really no peace, not in Europe, not elsewhere in the world. There's more and more uh, conflict. Now, the interwar period is the period between 1918, end of World War I, and 1939, uh, the beginning of World War II. So that interwar period is a period in which we don't have large-scale international armed conflict. But it is a chaotic and a very violent period um, because um, we basically have the collapse of empires. And when you see the collapse of a very large polity like an empire, it's problematic enough. But collapse of four empires, it's very disastrous for the international system as a whole. And basically the newly emerging powers that come out of these empires uh, have border conflicts, ethnic conflicts, civil war, civil conflicts, and uh, European countries themselves um, also have a lot of trouble uh, trying to settle the disputes of World War I. And World War I is uh, a period in which we see the first instances of what we call an arms race. An arms race is a type of international competition between countries uh, by which they produce more and more and more and more weapons. Uh, especially when we look at uh, the war performance of the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, that weren't fully industrialized countries, um, they basically suffered a lot at the end of World War I. And looking at the Austria-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, most countries said that it is impossible to win modern wars without a fully industrialized economy. You can't really be an empire. You can't really have uh, an unmodernized economy and win a war. So one of the reasons why the Ottoman Empire and Austria-Hungarian Empire um, lost so decisively, and even though German Empire was very advanced, uh, the alliance of Austria-Hungarian Empire and Ottoman Empire wasn't as strong as the German Empire itself. Uh, so <clears throat> basically this war demonstrated the power of industrialization. And from 1920s onwards, we see a huge drive towards mass industrialization in all countries. So before that, industrialization used to be something you would see in Britain, you know, Germany and France that in, after industrial revolution. But 1920s onwards, every country in the world is industrializing because they saw that industrialization wins World War I. And by 1920s, as a result of this mass industrialization, we see substantial increases in electricity demand in homes. Entire metropolitan areas, entire cities uh, basically run on electricity. And this leads to a much greater demand for products such as radios, electric irons, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, and washing machines. And practically, by 1920, the world of a statesman, the world of a general, the world of an inventor, and the world of a scientist is all merging together. The new modern world is built upon mass industrialization and a very strict and strong control over technology and rapid technological advancement. 
So 1920s onwards, we basically see a very rapid technological arms race between major countries. Now, most influential technologies before World War I is probably a huge increase in the mass use of electricity, invention of large power plants, able to supply electricity to larger cities and industries. And as a result, we see substantial increase in industrial production, most much more uh, significant compared to coal powered industries that we saw in 19th centuries and even greater demand for raw materials and new markets. And as a result, we see bigger demands for electrical goods for household items. So it creates a new industry and a new market. So mass use of electricity would probably be um, the most important technological development that we see in the interwar period. The emergence of the automotive industry is also a major development, which is mass production of cars. Uh, up until 1914, 1918, um, car was a luxury item that only the richest of the rich could afford or the most wealthy statesmen could afford. Um, but in 1901, uh, large oil fields were discovered in Texas. And in 1910, 1914, 1918, more oil fields were discovered around the world. So the world gradually shifts from coal-based engines into oil-based uh, combustion engines. And combustion engines render cars more efficient, faster, and also cheaper um, to both build and also to run. Um, the combination of improving internal combustion engines and lighter weight metallic designs lead to a huge explosion of demand for uh, vehicles. And um, because car manufacturing becomes cheaper, uh, it becomes uh, a common um, item for most wealthy families. But of course, technological advances in car manufacturing directly spill over into military technology on land, under the sea, in submarines, and eventually in the air. So engine development in automotive industries ended up benefiting military vehicles, you know, tanks, planes, uh, ships, submarines. So the automotive industry becomes a very influential uh, technology as well. And even though you know, first cases of flight uh, predate World War I, World War I demonstrates uh, the use and the benefit of controlling the skies. Whoever controlled the skies in World War I controlled the ground warfare. So whichever country um, had air superiority, they were able to drop bombs, conduct aerial reconnaissance, uh, and able basically end up winning um, the war. So basically, through the interwar period, we see a very important series of developments, such as the first transatlantic flight in 1919 and the first trans-Pacific flight in 1928. And through the interwar period, we see the development of more efficient engines. Uh, newer technological and scientific discoveries in aerodynamics that make uh, planes um, go uh, faster and uh, more efficient uh, way. Uh, developments in radio um, form what we call the second industrial revolution. And even though first examples of radio emerge in 1880s, Nikola Tesla, Edward Brandley, Oliver Joseph Lodge, um, Guglielmo Marconi, they all basically develop radio invention and radio transmission even further and further and further. And basically, even though by 1899, radio was being broadcast across the English Channel, in 1901, the first transatlantic signal was transmitted uh, from Cornwall to Newfoundland. And basically, Marconi's radio inventions and developments was they were basically adopted by the British Navy by 1910. So by 1918, 1920, radio becomes uh, a very important and influential technology that ends up dominating World War II. 
Then what we have is the invention of the radar. Uh, and it basically connects very uh, closely to the developments in radio because radar is also an extension of radio technology. And uh, practically the first radar trials uh, happened with the British Air Ministry in 1936. And um, by 1938, just like before the advent of World War II, we see the emergence of first radar systems emerging in Great Britain. And um, this becomes a way of defending against air attacks and early warning uh, against air attacks. So uh, radar becomes uh, developed uh, before the advent of World War II. Now, when we reach the year 1939, which is World War II, we have basically several interlocking dynamics in the world. One, um, the trauma and the chaos of World War I is still being felt across the entirety of the European continent. The first thing is League of Nations fails. During the 1920s, there were attempts to make uh, a, a stable peace, uh, but League of Nations gradually become weaker and weaker and weaker as <clears throat> revisionist powers such as Germany become stronger and stronger and stronger. And throughout the 1920s and 30s, we have global Great Depression and enormous uh, financial crisis, economic crisis, um, that basically uh, fuels poverty across the entire um, you know, European and American continent. So mass poverty uh, eventually leads to more extreme ideologies being popular, uh, such as fascism, uh, such as more militaristic and nationalistic totalitarian uh, tendencies becoming more and more popular, not just in Europe, but also in places like Japan, Southern America. And countries that were unhappy with the status quo of post-World War I order created a new alliance called the Axis Coalition uh, based on expansionism and revisionist uh, foreign policy. So it is, you know, World War II is a very popular uh, part of history. You know, people can talk about it uh, quite extensively. Uh, but what we saw in World War I, which is mass production, entire scientific and technological capacities of countries being used for war and destruction, everything we saw in World War I, we see tenfold, twentyfold in World War II. Um, so in World War II, we again have technological competition. Um, entire universities, scientists, engineers, and inventors work for militaries, you know, German armed forces, American armed forces, British armed forces. And some of the most important technological advances that we see in World War II uh, are really driven um, by military needs. So let's refresh our memory on what happened in World War II. John Green, this is Crash Course World History, and today we're going to talk about World War II, finally a war with some color film. So here at Crash Course, we try to make history reasonably entertaining, and fortunately, World War II was hilarious, said no one ever. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, is this like going to be one of the unfunny ones where you build to the big melodramatic conclusion about how I have to imagine the world more complexly? Me from the past, as long as you have that eighth-rate soup strainer, I'm not even going to acknowledge your existence. <laughs> Right, so you've probably heard a lot about World War II from movies and books, the History Channel before it decided that swamp people were history, the incessant droning of your grandparents, etc. We're not going to try to give you a detailed synopsis of the war today. Instead, we're going to try to give a bit of perspective on how the most destructive war in human history happened and why it still matters globally. So one of the reasons history classes tend to be really into wars is that they're easy to put on tests. They start on one day and they end on another day, and they're caused by social, political, and economic conditions that 
that can be examined in a multiple choice kind of manner. Except not really. Like, when did World War II start? In September 1939, when the Nazis invaded Poland? I'd say no. It actually started when Japan invaded Manchuria in 1931, or at the very latest, when the Japanese invaded China in 1937, because they didn't stop fighting until 1945. Then again, you could also argue 1933, when Hitler took power, or 1941, when America started fighting? It's complicated. But anyway, in China, the fighting was very brutal, as exemplified by the infamous Rape of Nanking, which featured the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of Chinese people and is still so controversial today that one, it affects relations between Japan and China, and two, even though I have not described it in detail, you can rest assured that there will be angry comments about my use of the word slaughter. But the World War II we know the most about from movies and TV is primarily the war in the European theater, the one that Adolf Hitler started. Hitler is the rare individual who really did make history, specifically he made it worse. And if he hadn't existed, it's very unlikely that World War II would have ever happened. But he did exist. And after coming to power in 1933 with the standard revolutionary promises to return the homeland to its former glory, infused with quite a bit of paranoia and anti-Semitism, Germany saw rapid remilitarization and eventually, inevitably, war. In the beginning, it was characterized by a new style of combat made possible by the mechanized technology of tanks, airplanes, and especially trucks. This was the Blitzkrieg, a devastating tactic combining quick movement of troops, tanks, and massive use of air power to support infantry movements. And in the very early years of the war, it was extremely effective. The Nazis were able to roll over Poland, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, and then all of France, all within about nine months between the fall of 1939 and the summer of 1940. So after knocking out most of Central Europe, the Nazis set their sights on Great Britain, but they didn't invade the island, choosing instead to attack it with massive airstrikes. I mean, you look at this poster and think, man, the Queen wants me to finish my term paper so I can do it, but when this poster was first produced in 1939, it was to quell terror in the face of bombardment. The Battle of Britain was a duel between the Royal Air Force and the Luftwaffe, and while the RAF denied the Nazis total control of British airspace, the Nazis were still able to bomb Great Britain over and over again in what's known as the Blitz. Stan, no, no, no jokes this time. Yes, the Blitz. Meanwhile, Europeans were also fighting each other in North Africa. The Desert Campaign started in 1940 and lasted through 1942. This is where British General Mon Monty Montgomery outfoxed Erwin the Desert Fox Rommel. It's also the place where Americans first fought Nazis in large numbers, but most importantly, it's where Indiana Jones discovered the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, let's go to the thought bubble. 1941 was a big year for World War II. First, the Nazis invaded Russia, breaking a non-aggression pact that the two powers had signed in 1939. This hugely escalated the war and also made allies of the most powerful capitalist countries and the most powerful communist one, an alliance that would stand the test of time and never end until like three seconds after the defeat of the Nazis. The Nazi invasion of Russia opened the war up on the so-called Eastern Front, although if you were Russian, it was the Western Front, and it led to millions of deaths, mostly Russian. Also, 1941 saw a day that would live in infamy when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, hoping that such an audacious attack would frighten the United States into staying neutral, which was a pretty stupid gamble because one, the US was already giving massive aid to the Allies and was hardly neutral, and two, the United States is not exactly famed for its pacifism or political neutrality. 1941 also saw Japan invading much of Southeast Asia, which made Australia and New Zealand understandably nervous. As part of the British Commonwealth, they were already involved in the war, but now they could fight the Japanese closer to home. And shut up about how I never talk about you Australians, I just gave you 1.5 sentences. But by the time the Americans and Australians started fighting the Japanese, it was already a world war. Sometimes this meant fighting or starving or being bombed, other times it meant production for the war. You don't think of Argentina as being a World War II powerhouse, for instance, but they were vital to the Allies, supplying 40% of British meat during World War II. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So not to sound jingoistic, but the entry of the U.S. into the war really did change everything, although I doubt the Nazis could have taken Russia regardless. No one conquers Russia in the wintertime, unless you are, wait for it, the Mongols. Okay, we're gonna skip most of the big battles of 1942, like the Battle of Midway, which effectively ended Japan's chance of winning the war, and focus on the Battle of Stalingrad. The German attack on Stalingrad, now known as Volgograd because Stalin sucks, was one of the bloodiest battles in the history of war, with more than two million dead. The Germans began by dropping more than a thousand tons of bombs on Stalingrad, and then the Russians responded by hugging the Germans, staying as close to their front lines as possible so that German air support would kill Germans and Russians alike. This kind of worked 
although the Germans still took most of the city. But then a Soviet counterattack left the 6th Army of the Nazis completely cut off. And after that, due partly to Hitler's overreaching megalomania and partly to lots of people being scared of him, the 6th Army slowly froze and starved to death before finally surrendering. And of the 91,000 Axis POWs from Stalingrad, only about 6,000 ever returned home. Stalingrad turned the war in Europe, and by 1944, the American strategy of island hopping in the Pacific was taking GIs closer and closer to Japan. Rome was liberated in June by Americans and Canadians, and the successful British, Canadian, and American D-Day invasion of Normandy was the beginning of the end for the Nazis. Oh, it's time for the open letter? An open letter to Canada. But first, let's see what's in the secret compartment today. Oh! It's Canadian mittens! I want to thank the Canadian Crash Course fans who sent us these mittens. Canadians are just so nice, Stan. Like, all we ever do on this show is make fun of them, and they're just like, it's so kind of you to mention us. Here's some mittens! Dear Canada, we're not always nice to you here on Crash Course, but you are awesome. I'm pointing, but you can't tell because I'm wearing mittens. 45,000 Canadians died fighting for the Allies in World War II, which means that per capita, Canada lost more people than the United States. You fought with the Royal Air Force to defend Great Britain from the beginning of the war, and you were there on D day successfully invading Juneau Beach, and as many of you have pointed out in comments, you defeated the United States in the War of 1812, meaning that arguably, Canada, you are the greater military power. Plus, you have lumberjacks, and excellent beer, and hockey, and universal health care, and Justin Bieber! I'm jealous! That's what it is! I'm jealous! Best wishes. John Green. So by the end of 1944, the Allies were advancing from the west, and the Russian Red Army was advancing from the east, and then the last-ditch German offensive at the Battle of the Bulge in the winter of 1944 and 1945 failed. Mussolini was executed in April of 1945. Hitler committed suicide at the end of that month, and on May 8, 1945, the Allies declared victory in Europe after Germany surrendered unconditionally. Three months later, the United States dropped the only two nuclear weapons ever deployed in war, Japan surrendered, and World War II was over. The war had a definite cause, unbridled military expansion by Germany, Japan, and to a small extent, Italy. Now, it's easy to claim that Hitler was crazy or evil, and in fact, he was certainly both, but but that doesn't explain the Nazis' decision to invade Russia, and it sure doesn't explain Japan's decision to bomb Pearl Harbor. And there are many possible explanations beyond mere evil, but the most interesting one to me involves food. Hitler had a number of reasons for wanting to expand Germany's territory, but he often talked about Lebensraum, or living space, for the German people. German agriculture was really inefficiently organized into lots of small farms, and that meant that Germany needed a lot of land in order to be self-sufficient in food production. The plan was to take Poland, the Ukraine, and Eastern Russia and then resettle that land with lots of Germans so that it could feed German people. This was called the Hunger Plan, because the plan called for 20 million people to starve to death. Many would be the Poles, Ukrainians, and Russians who'd previously lived on the land. The rest would be Europe's Jews, who would be worked to death. Six million Jews were killed by the Nazis, many by starvation, but many through a chillingly planned effort of extermination in death camps. These death camps can be distinguished from concentration camps or labor camps in that their primary purpose was extermination of Jews, Roma people, communists, homosexuals, disabled people, and others that the Nazis deemed unfit. Some historians believe that the Nazis opened the death camps because the Jews weren't dying as fast as the hunger plan had intended. This was a sickening plan, but it made a kind of demented sense. Rather than becoming more involved in global trade as the British had, the Germans would feed themselves by taking land and killing the people who'd previously lived there. Similarly, Japan at the beginning of the war was suffering from an acute fear of food shortage because its agricultural sector was having trouble keeping up with population growth. And the Japanese, too, sought to expand their agricultural holdings by, for instance, resettling farmers in Korea. So while it's tempting to say that World War II was about the Allies fighting for democratic ideals against the totalitarian militaristic imperialism of the fascist Axis powers, it just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. For instance, a hugely important Allied power, Stalin's Soviet Union, was like the least democratic place ever. Stan just said that was hyperbole, but it's not. Stalin's Soviet Union is tied with all of the other completely undemocratic countries for last place on the democracy scale. It's a big community there at last place, but they're definitely in there somewhere. And by far the biggest imperialists of the war were the British. They couldn't have fed or clothed themselves or resisted the Nazis without their colonies and commonwealth. So why is World War II so important? Well, first it proved the old Roman adage, homo homini lupus. Man is a wolf 
to man. This is seen most clearly in the Holocaust, but all the statistics are staggering. More than a million Indian British subjects died, mainly due to famine that could have been avoided if the British had redistributed food, and their failure to do so helped convince Indians that the so-called superior civilization of the British was a sham. More than a million Vietnamese died, mainly due to famine. 418,000 Americans, more than a million non-combatants in both Germany and Japan, and 20 million people in the Soviet Union, most of them civilians. These civilians were targeted because they helped sustain the war, mostly through industrial and agricultural production. In a total war, when a nation is at war, not just its army, there's no such thing as a non-military target. From the firebombing of Dresden to Tokyo to Hiroshima, the line between soldier and civilian blurred. And then, of course, there is the Holocaust which horrifies us because the elements of Western progress, record-keeping, industrial production, technology, were used to slaughter millions. World War II saw modern industrial nations, which represented the best of the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution, descend into once unimaginable cruelty. And what makes World War II such a historical watershed is that in its wake, all of us, in the West or otherwise, were forced to question whether Western dominance of this planet could or should be considered progress. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. This was a really important and really short um, you know, exposition of World War II because it's really difficult to summarize World War II very quickly, but there are certain things. One um, is that Germany, Italy, and Japan that were unhappy with the international system had grown too powerful uh, during the interwar period. They industrialized, they managed to grow uh, into large nations. And they basically said that um, the interwar uh, international system no longer reflected the power of their nation. So that is what we call a revisionist power. A revisionist power is a power that is not happy with how things are, which is the status quo. Status quo means how things are. And revisionists want revision, meaning a change. Um, and revisionism is basically uh, the ideology and policy of changing the status quo and changing how things are. So Japan, Italy, Germany were revisionist powers that had become very, very powerful between 1918 and 1939 um, that have be developed industrially, technologically, scientifically that they basically wanted to fight a war in order to change the international system and balance of power. And at the end of the war, they were defeated. And what we have at the end of World War II is that the United States, um, which was a growing power by 1918, had grown into a superpower along with the USSR. So, hi, I'm we have to talk a little bit about how the world changed after um, World War II. One, it ended the traditional Eurocentric international power structure. And when you think about past weeks of this lecture, since I would say mid 15th century, we really have a Europe centric uh, power structure, which means European countries gradually dominate other countries in the world. You know, when you remember, you know, Jared Diamond's uh, argument, why did Europe colonize the rest of the world? And why didn't other countries in the world ended up colonizing Europe? Why did Europe become so powerful? And by mid 15th century, with the discovery of the new world and um, European powers, you know, Spain, Portugal, France, Netherlands, uh, Great Britain becoming you know, massively uh, powerful. We have a Eurocentric international power structure from 1550s up until 1945, uh, Europe dominated world politics and the international system. Whatever happened in the rest of the world, all of them had some connection to what happened between European countries themselves. Um, but by the end of World War II, 
Europe was completely destroyed. Germany was destroyed. Italy was destroyed. Even victors like Britain, France, their economies were completely shattered. Um, Soviet Union emerged as a superpower, but its economy was also very much destroyed by the war. United States, on the other hand, and Canada to some extent, Australia to some extent, they largely emerged as unscathed from the war. And beginning with 1945, we see the emergence of kind of the end of the Eurocentric international power structure, where we see the emergence of uh, non-European powers, USSR and United States as hegemons and as superpowers. Now, after the war, Germany and Italy became very weak as a result of their defeats in the war. Britain and France also become weak due to their heavy losses. And the war destroyed the balance of power system in Europe because war destroyed Europe. And there appeared a power vacuum in um, Europe, especially an economic power vacuum, because all of the economies of Europe were destroyed. Europe lost its position as the epicenter of international politics. After 1945, international politics became uh, driven by Washington and Moscow and not London or Paris. And a weak Europe set the stage for the liberation of Asian and African countries from the clutches of imperialism and colonialism. And 1950s onwards, we see uh, anti-colonial revolution movements and rebellions across Asia and Africa. And practically, Europe and the entire world system was being split between US-controlled world and USSR-controlled world. And this polarity basically draw what we call Cold War. And the emergence of the Cold War, of course. In the post-war period, the United States decided to use its superior economic military position for filling the power vacuum in Europe and basically tried to build European economies through Marshall Plan. And Marshall Plan was important because the United States feared that if European countries that were collapsed at the end of World War II, if they succumbed into poverty and hunger, they would basically be more receptive to communism. So the entire American plan after 1945 was to develop European economies and save them from um, communism. And a similar kind of strategy emerged in Asia. We have the emergence of bipolarity or a bipolar power structure. Now, in international relations, international system of power is divided into polarities. Unipolar means one single pole, it means that there is one single superpower. Bipolarity means there are two poles, meaning that there are two superpowers. Multipolarity means there are multiple poles and multiple power sources, such as 18th, 19th century Europe. And practically from 1945 until 1991, we have a bipolar world structure, an entire world system split between US controlled nations and USSR controlled uh, nations. And this is what we essentially call as the Cold War. Basically, Cold War is usually seen as competition between United States and Soviet Union. But Cold War is actually an economic competition over two dominant ideologies of economic development, socialism and capitalism. And the competition between socialism and capitalism is really a competition to answer the question of how to run a modern state. What is the best way? What is the best economic model that uh, a modern state can use? Because at the end of World War I, we realized that empires or imperial systems or monarchies were not conducive to run a modern state. You can't be a kingdom. You can't be an empire. And uh, run a modern state. 
uh, you become backward, slow, and collapse. So the world between the interwar period tried parliamentary and constitutional systems with varying degrees of success. By 1945, this question evolved into a different kind of question. Maybe it's not about republic, constitution, imperialism, or whatever. Maybe it's about the economic model of that polity. Maybe it is about centralized state control over the economy versus minimal state control over the economy. Let's look at this in more detail. As the Second World War went silent, two superpowers emerged as opposing poles of political thinking. On one side was the President of the United States, Harry S. Truman, a believer in liberalism, democracy, and capitalist free enterprise. On the other side in Moscow was the Soviet Premier, Joseph Stalin. He was a believer in communism, self-sufficiency, and material guarantees for his country's citizens. Two leaders with conflicting ideas for what the world needed, and neither had room for the other. The ideologies acted as the driving force of the entire Cold War. Two powers with incompatible worldviews, but each backed up their views with apocalyptic amounts of nuclear weapons. Today, we're going to talk about just how different these worldviews were. Let's begin with what is likely the most obvious difference, economics. No, really, don't leave. It's interesting, I promise. The United States and the Soviet Union had completely different concepts of what made an economy both fair and just. Each side also happened to see the other's chosen mode of economics as an affront to human rights and freedom. Let's begin with the United States, and it will not likely come as a surprise to most if it was said the leadership of the United States believes in capitalism. But what does capitalism actually mean? The main concept behind it is that the main things that drive the economy, factories, farms, businesses, all belong to private individuals, called capitalists. A capitalist is someone who uses their own money to invest into a business in the hopes of turning a profit. For work that they cannot do themselves, or do not want to do, employees are hired and paid a wage for that work. For somebody who believes in capitalism, they would agree that this is the ideal free society. It gives everyone the freedom to try new ideas and compete to see which ones work the best, but also creates competition which ensures prices stay low. The critique of capitalism, however, is that it can create social and economic inequality and damage the environment. It also creates cycles of prosperity and recession and those who work wage jobs do not make enough money to enjoy the prosperous times, but still suffer the negative consequences of those depressions. The Soviet Union tried to run a socialist economy, where the things that drive the economy – factories, farms, businesses – all belong to everyone. They valued strong cooperation over competition. The Soviets planned every function of the economy through the government. Supporters of this type of system would point out that there was zero unemployment in the Soviet Union. The system also allowed for the economy to be focused on significant tasks, which was great when you needed to do something large, like defeat Nazi Germany or send people into space. However, a critique of the system would point out that what is being presented as collective ownership by the people is actually government ownership. With only a single controller, mismanagement could, and did, lead to crippling shortages and even mass starvation. Another stark difference between the ideologies of the USA and the USSR was what it meant to have representation. The United States has held a particular view of what it means to represent and to be represented. This is a view that began with the American Revolution and persisted, albeit in an altered form, during the Cold War. Although George Washington might not have approved, the U.S. adopted two competing political parties quite early on. Although sometimes there has been more than two parties, for the most part, the interest of the American voter has needed to fit into one of two political parties. This is central to the U.S. notion of what makes a democracy. There needs to be at least two parties. The Soviet Union had a different concept of democracy. It might surprise you, but elections were held in the USSR. There just happened to be only one party. 
Although this might strike you as a pointless exercise, it wasn't necessarily. There can be different ideas and different choices in an election within the same political party. However, other political parties were outlawed until the very end of the Soviet Union. The Soviets believed in the concept put down by Karl Marx of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Marxist belief held that political parties each represented different classes of people. It follows logically then that if there are no more classes, there should not be political parties either. Of course, at the beginning of the Cold War, Soviet leadership had the extra layer that was Joseph Stalin. He was, even compared to other Soviet leaders, extremely authoritarian. His ideas of democracy were non-existent. However, once you move forward in time past the Stalinist era, many Soviet leaders at least attempted to undo the damage caused by Stalin's authoritarian regime. So now let's combine some of these ideas of economic direction and political representation. The Soviet Union and the USA had different concepts of what an ideal trade relationship to the rest of the world should look like. The difference can be boiled down to the disparity in the relative strength of each empire. Keep in mind, the Cold War was never a fair fight. The US was always better off compared to the Soviet Union, but nonetheless, they took different approaches to trade. The United States believed in so-called free markets. The liberal worldview believes that free markets make free people, and the best way to spread freedom is to open trade barriers wherever they exist. This meant encouraging less government intervention in the market, with lower trade tariffs elsewhere. A cynic would point out that this leaves countries vulnerable, as the influence of a country with a larger production capacity and large corporations, just like the United States, could easily expand their influence there. This could also allow these corporations to more or less take control of that country's resources. The USSR's idea of trade was largely derived from their feeling of being on the defensive throughout the Cold War. While this viewpoint is certainly at odds with the Western notion that the Soviet Union wanted to expand and take over the world, the idea of communist vanguard to overthrow global capitalism was largely dead in the wake of the Second World War. Stalin was highly paranoid and saw the US and other capitalist countries as being out to tear down the Soviet Union. But we need to ask ourselves, is it still paranoia if those anxieties are true? This idea of a hostile worldview led the Soviets to practice autarky, a dedication to economic self-sufficiency. They needed to make sure that the Soviet government could still function even in the face of economic sanctions or even invasion. Autarky is still practiced in a few remaining communist countries today. In Cuba, for example, cars originally built in the 1950s are still in use, having been repaired, re-repaired, and re-re-repaired over the decades. Finally, and for many, most importantly, the largest difference between the USA and the USSR was regarding the concept of what rights were. What did the government owe to and vow to protect for its citizens? The United States, as a liberal country, sees rights as freedoms. Even today, you may still hear terms like equality of opportunity, where everyone has an equal chance to succeed despite circumstances at birth. That expression, equality of opportunity, likely speaks more to the liberal idea of rights than any other phrase. The American concept of rights is centered around choices, personal liberties, and the ability to build life as each person sees fit. It also makes no promise or guarantee of success, or even that basic needs will be met, but with hard work, anything can be achieved by anyone. These are noble ideas steeped in the concepts of equality and opportunity. Now consider that at the end of the Second World War, the United States was a country that still practiced racial segregation and even had its own empire, not that it would actually call it that. As the Cold War progressed, the US would go to bat in defense of colonizers over the colonized. The ideals of the United States were noble in spirit, but somewhat tarnished in practice. The Soviet Union took a different approach to rights. The Soviets looked at the United States, with their emphasis on freedom, choice, and opportunity, as bourgeois attempts to convince themselves of their own freedom, while supporting a system based on inequality. There's an old saying that the Americans were scientists while the Soviets were engineers, and we can apply this analogy to this situation. The Americans were idealists, working with high concepts and theories. The Soviets, on the other hand, focused on what worked and what was practical, 
When applied to rights, the Soviets focused on such tangible items as food, shelter, and jobs. Of course, how they provided these things to their citizens varied, depending on the time frame and the state of the economy. But in the end, the role of the government was to secure for the Soviet citizen a home, a job, and even their next meal. It's worth noting that the Soviet view of equality smacked of its own hypocrisy when one compares the differences in life between the regular Soviet citizenship and the Soviet leadership. The Americans saw capitalism and liberalism as the only way to end tyranny around the globe. The Soviets, in juxtaposition to this, saw communism as necessary to liberate humanity, the final revolution to save mankind. Two entirely irreconcilable ideas. Both ideas had passionate believers. Both ideas had passionate believers with access to enough weapons to wipe out humanity several times over. This rivalry could not end with a truce, but was seen as an intense fight to the death on every front. The discussion of the ideologies will continue in the future videos. Right. Let's get deeper into these concepts. Like we talked about you know, socialism, communism, and capitalism. But we need to think more deeply about these things. So let's do that. Most people agree that we need to improve our economic system somehow. Yet we're also often keen to dismiss the ideas of capitalism's most famous and ambitious critic, Karl Marx. This isn't very surprising. In practice, his political and economic ideas have been used to design disastrously planned economies and nasty dictatorships. Nevertheless, we shouldn't reject Marx too quickly. We ought to see him as a guide whose diagnosis of capitalism's ills helps us to navigate towards a more promising future. Capitalism is going to have to be reformed, and Marx's analyses are going to be part of any answer. Marx was born in 1818 in Trier in Germany. Soon he became involved with the Communist Party, a tiny group of intellectuals advocating for the overthrow of the class system and the abolition of private property. He worked as a journalist and had to flee Germany, eventually settling in London. Marx wrote an enormous number of books and articles, sometimes with his friend Friedrich Engels. Mostly, Marx wrote about capitalism, the type of economy that dominates the Western world. It was, in his day, still getting going, and Marx was one of its most intelligent and perceptive critics. These were some of the problems he identified with it. Modern work is alienated. One of Marx's greatest insights is that work can be one of the sources of our greatest joys. But, in order to be fulfilled at work, Marx wrote that workers need to see themselves in the objects they have created. Think of the person who built this chair. It's straightforward, strong, honest and elegant. It's an example of how, at its best, labour offers us a chance to externalise what's good inside us. But this is increasingly rare in the modern world. Part of the problem is that modern work is incredibly specialised. Specialised jobs make the modern economy highly efficient, but they also mean that it's seldom possible for any one worker to derive a sense of the genuine contribution they might be making to the real needs of humanity. Marx argued that modern work leads to alienation, entfremdung. In other words, a feeling of disconnection between what you do all day and who you feel you really are and what you think you'd ideally be able to contribute to existence. Modern work is insecure. Capitalism makes the human being utterly expendable, just one factor among others in the forces of production, and one that can ruthlessly be let go the minute the costs rise or savings can be made through technology. And yet, as Marx knew deep inside each of us, we don't want to be arbitrarily let go. We're terrified of being abandoned. Communism isn't just an economic theory. Understood emotionally, it expresses a deep-seated longing that we always have a place in the world's heart, that we will not be cast out. Workers get paid little, while capitalists get rich. This is perhaps the most obvious qualm that Marx had with capitalism. In particular, he believed that capitalists shrink the wages of the labourers as much as possible in order to skim off a wide profit margin. He called this primitive accumulation, ursprüngliche Akkumulation. Whereas capitalists see profit as a reward for ingenuity and technological talent, Marx was far more damning. Profit is simply theft, and what you're stealing is the talent and hard work of your workforce. 
However much one dresses up the fundamentals, Marx insists that at its crudest, capitalism means paying a worker one price for doing something and then selling it to somebody else at a much higher price. Profit is the fancy term for exploitation. Capitalism is very unstable. Marx proposed that capitalist systems are characterized by a series of crises. Every crisis is dressed up by capitalists as being somehow freakish and rare and soon to be the last one. Far from it, argued Marx. Crises are endemic to capitalism, and they're caused by something rather odd. The fact that we're able to produce too much, far more than anyone needs to consume. Capitalist crises are crises of abundance, rather than, as in the past, crises of shortage. Our factories and systems are so efficient, we could give everyone on this planet a car, a house, access to a decent school and a hospital. And that's what so enraged Marx, but also made him so hopeful too. Few of us actually need to work, because the modern economy is so productive. But rather than seeing this need not to work as the freedom it is, we complain about it masochistically and describe it by a pejorative word, unemployment. We should call it freedom. There's so much unemployment for a good and deeply admirable reason, because we're so good at making things efficiently. We're not all needed at the coalface. But in that case, we should, thought Marx, make leisure admirable. We should redistribute the wealth of the massive corporations that make so much surplus money and give it to everyone. This is, in its own way, as beautiful a dream as Jesus' promise of heaven, but a good deal more realistic sounding. Capitalism is bad for capitalists. Marx didn't think that capitalists were evil. For example, he was acutely aware of the sorrows and secret agonies that lay behind bourgeois marriage. Marx argued that marriage was actually an extension of business and that the bourgeois family was fraught with tension, oppression and resentment, with people staying together not for love but for financial reasons. Marx believed that the capitalist system forces everyone to put economic interests at the heart of their lives so that they can no longer know deep, honest relationships. He called this psychological tendency commodity fetishism, Waren fetishismus, because it makes us value things that have no objective value. He wanted people to be freed from financial constraint so that they could, at last, start to make sensible, healthy choices in their relationships. The 20th century feminist answer to the oppression of women has been to argue that women should simply be able to go out to work. But Marx's answer was more subtle. This feminist insistence merely perpetuates human slavery. The point isn't that women should imitate the sufferings of their male colleagues. It's that men and women should have the permanent option to enjoy leisure. Why don't we all think a bit more like Marx? An important aspect of Marx's work is that he proposes that there's an insidious, subtle way in which the economic system colours the sort of ideas that we end up having. The economy generates what Marx termed an ideology. A capitalist society is one where most people, rich and poor, believe all sorts of things that are really just value judgments that relate back to the economic system. For example, that a person who doesn't work is worthless, that leisure beyond a few weeks a year is sinful, that more belongings will make us happier, and that worthwhile things and people will invariably make money. In short, one of the biggest evils of capitalism is not that there are corrupt people at the top. This is true in any human hierarchy but that capitalist ideas teach all of us to be anxious, competitive, conformist and politically complacent. Marx didn't only outline what was wrong with capitalism, we also get glimpses of what Marx wanted the ideal utopian future to be like. In his Communist Manifesto, he describes a world without private property or inherited wealth, with a steeply graduated income tax, centralised control of the banking, communication and transport industries and free public education. Marx also expected that communist society would allow people to develop lots of different sides of their natures. In communist society, it's possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticise after dinner, just as I have a mind without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman or critic. After Marx moved to London, he was supported by his friend and intellectual partner Friedrich Engels, a wealthy man whose father owned a cotton plant in Manchester. Engels covered Marx's debts and made sure his works were published. Capitalism paid for communism. The two men even wrote each other adoring poetry. Marx was not a well-regarded or popular intellectual in his day, 
Respectable, conventional people of Marx's day would have laughed at the idea that his ideas could remake the world. Yet, just a few decades later, they did. His writings became the keystone for some of the most important ideological movements of the 20th century. But Marx was like a brilliant doctor in the early days of medicine. He could recognise the nature of the disease, although he had no idea how to go about curing it. At this point in history, we should all be Marxists, in the sense of agreeing with his diagnosis of our troubles. But we need to go out and find the cures that really will work. As Marx himself declared, and we deeply agree, philosophers until now have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Right. So, essentially, these... Um, <clears throat> Two ideologies, you know, we can't really say Marxism and socialism. Essentially, it was between capitalism and communism. But <clears throat> from 1945 until 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Cold War was defined by what we call an arms race. What is an arms race? Arms race is a competition between nations for superiority in the development and accumulation of weapons, generally. An arms race are seen between powers of similar size and can be observed between large empires throughout this. For example, between 14th to 15th centuries, we have competition over gunpowder technologies, how to develop better rifles, how to uh, develop better cannons, for example. Uh, 15th to 16th century, we have an arms race over naval superiority, who can build uh, the better battleship, who can build better sail systems, for example. Uh, from 16th to 17th centuries, we have uh, an arms race over artillery technology, you know, the development of howitzers, development of modern cannons. So arms races are very strictly connected to technological development and innovation. And in the Cold War, we have a huge, of course, technological competition between the two sides, you know, who can build the better plane, who can build the better tank, who can build a better circuit board, who can build a better computer. But boiled down, uh, the Cold War was a technological competition in two main areas. One, competition over nuclear technology and nuclear weapons, and also competition over space, who can be the first one to land on the moon who can be the first one to orbit around the moon. So let's focus on these a little bit. Tick, tick, tick. Do you hear that? It's five minutes before midnight and time is running out. During the Cold War, the East and the West with their atomic weapon overkill had the chance to completely blow up the Earth. And we are lucky that the Earth is still here for now as the hands of the doomsday clock did not strike 12. Welcome history junkies, I'm Brett and welcome to another episode of It's History. You probably have already noticed that with the Cold War there was always a concern for who was better. The East and the West wanted to win every competition. Athletic competition was mostly innocent, but anything less than that, however, was a military match. Everyone wanted to have the latest, the most effective, most dangerous weapon. Yes, we are talking about the arms race. And what exactly is that? Well, the hostile opposing states or alliances increase their spending on tanks, missiles, and a bunch of other military stuff. And of course, if one buys a large rocket, the other has to buy an even bigger rocket. This was basically how the so-called arms race developed. The United States is a member of the military alliance NATO, which was established in 1949. The Soviet Union, however, established its own military alliance in 1955, the Warsaw Pact. Now, it never came to an actual military confrontation between the two alliances. Rather, there were proxy wars. What is a proxy war? Well, it's characterized by two sides fighting to exert power and influence over a third state. In many cases, this third state is under some conflict that the two sides work to exploit for their own purposes. A good example is the Vietnam War from 1965 to 1973. The Soviet Union and China supported North Vietnam with weapons. And what about the United States? 
Well, they supported and fought on the side of South Vietnam. So back home to the arms race. During the Cold War, the US almost always had the lead. By 1950, the US had 300 nuclear warheads to the Soviets' 10. In 1945, the US released its first nuclear test in the New Mexico desert. A month later, it would drop bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. For the United States, it wasn't just about defeating Japan, no. The dispute with the Soviet Union was already heating up by then, and the US wanted to demonstrate its military strength. By 1949, the Soviets finally had their own nuclear test. So let the arms race begin. Step by step, a scenario of nuclear deterrence was drawn up that was a doctrine that based its principles on the idea of mutually assured destruction, short for MAD. Sounds charming, right? There was also talk about a balance of terror. I can tell you this much, it was definitely crazy. In America, 1953, Dwight D. Eisenhower became president, and he gave guidelines for dealing with the USSR conflict those of massive retaliation. It stipulates that any attack would be answered with a force large enough to ensure complete destruction. Now this strategy worked, in a way, as long as the United States remained superior when it came to nuclear weapons. But by this time, in 1956, the Soviets had already shot their satellite Sputnik into space. To the West, if the Soviets could launch into space, they could just as well launch a missile into the United States. Well, when both sides had this ability, the strategy of a massive retaliation no longer seemed to be such a deterrent. By 1962, the USA and Soviet Union are actually on the brink of war. Do you remember our last episode on the Cuban Missile Crisis? That's what we're talking about here. Never before had the East and West been so close to using nuclear weapons. Afterwards, there was a change in attitude as the two sides saw how dangerous it all was. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was an easing of tension between the two superpowers. However, this did not mean disarmament. With an emphasis on stability, the powers agreed on various controls on arms and on a so-called controlled rearmament. That means a limit to the amount of arms that both sides must agree to keeping. In addition, the US and NATO moved away from the principles of massive retaliation. Instead, they developed a flexible response principle where nuclear weapons could be used only if normal military forces are not sufficient. This principle would be written into NATO doctrine by 1967. And then the following happened. The Soviet Union replaced its older missile systems aimed at targets in Europe with modern weapons, namely the SS-20 missiles. NATO threatened to deploy its own new intermediate range rockets. In the so-called dual-track decision of 1979, NATO and the Soviet Union entered negotiations mostly geared towards eliminating the SS-20 missiles. Should talks fail, NATO would give itself an upgrade. Now, such means of deterrence was not received well by the Soviets, and shortly afterwards they marched right into Afghanistan. And so the momentary easing of hostilities was over with a bang. But slowly, everyone began to have enough of this constant threat of mutual destruction. In 1983, US President Ronald Reagan spoke about creating a nuclear free world for the first time. In the Soviet Union, two years later, Mikhail Gorbachev came into power. Now, he was a reformer and wanted to make things different from his authoritarian predecessor. The Soviet Union had economic problems and Gorbachev knew that they could not keep up in this intensified arms race in the long run. So it was expensive to keep up to date with the newest technology and Gorbachev wanted to use the money for reform instead of armament policy. Finally, the time came for real disarmament resolutions. At a meeting in Reykjavik, a decision was made to abolish nuclear weapons. A world without nuclear weapons. Well, we still haven't seen that yet. The question is, why did it take so long to finally get to disarmament? Well, for one thing, everyone involved in the nuclear balance sort of secured the peace. This balance of terror basically prevented either side from turning things into a hot war. Nevertheless, we must make one thing clear. The whole situation was more a non-peace, because let's face it, this so-called peace could become a nuclear war within a short period of time, which could destroy a large part of humanity. And by the way, my new colleague Guy also made a great- Yeah, we're not going to subscribe to you. So let's move on to the next step of Cold War technological arms competition, you know, the space race, who will basically go to the space first. On October 4th, 1957, the world watched in awe and fear as the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the world's first man-made satellite into space. This little metal ball, smaller than two feet in diameter, launched a space race between the US and USSR that would last for 18 years and change the world as we know it. 
Sputnik was actually not the first piece of human technology to enter space. That superlative goes to the V-2 rocket, used by Germany in missile attacks against Allied cities as a last-ditch effort in the final years of World War II. It wasn't very effective, but at the end of the war, both the U.S. and USSR had captured the technology and the scientists that had developed it and began using them for their own projects. And by August 1957, the Soviets successfully tested the first intercontinental ballistic missile, the R-7, the same rocket that would be used to launch Sputnik two months later. So the scary thing about Sputnik was not the orbiting ball itself, but the fact that the same technology could be used to launch a nuclear warhead at any city. Not wanting to fall too far behind, President Eisenhower ordered the Navy to speed up its own project and launch a satellite as soon as possible. So on December 6, 1957, excited people across the nation tuned in to watch the live broadcast as the Vanguard TV-3 satellite took off and crashed to the ground two seconds later. The Vanguard failure was a huge embarrassment for the United States. Newspapers printed headlines like Flopnik and Kaputnik, and a Soviet delegate at the UN mockingly suggested that the US should receive foreign aid for developing nations. Fortunately, the Army had been working on their own parallel project, the Explorer, which was successfully launched in January 1958. But the US had barely managed to catch up before they were surpassed again as Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space in April 1961. Almost a year passed, and several more Soviet astronauts completed their missions before Project Mercury succeeded in making John Glenn the first American in orbit in February 1962. By this time, President Kennedy had realized that simply catching up to each Soviet advance a few months later wasn't going to cut it. The U.S. had to do something first, and in May 1961, a month after Gagarin's flight, he announced the goal of putting a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s. They succeeded in this through the Apollo program, with Neil Armstrong taking his famous step on July 20th, 1969. With both countries next turning their attention to orbital space stations, there's no telling how much longer the space race could have gone on. But because of improving relations negotiated by Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev and U.S. President Nixon, the USSR and U.S. moved toward cooperation rather than competition. The successful joint mission known as Apollo-Soyuz, in which an American Apollo spacecraft docked with a Soviet Soyuz craft and the two crews met, shook hands, and exchanged gifts, marked the end of the space race in 1975. So in the end, what was the point of this whole space race? Was it just a massive waste of time? Two major superpowers trying to outdo each other by pursuing symbolic projects that were both dangerous and expensive? Using resources that could have been better spent elsewhere? Well, sure, sort of. But the biggest benefits of the space program had nothing to do with one country beating another. During the space race, funding for research and education in general increased dramatically, leading to many advances that may not have otherwise been made. Many NASA technologies developed for space are now widely used in civilian life, from memory foam in mattresses, to freeze-dried food, to LEDs in cancer treatment. And of course, the satellites that we rely on for our GPS and mobile phone signals would not have been there without the space program. All of which goes to show that the rewards of scientific research and advancement are often far more vast than even the people pursuing them can imagine. Right, that's the reason why both <clears throat> the nuclear um, race and the space race were so important. It wasn't about space or nuclear power specifically. It's about the spillover technologies that were being developed. And most of the computer technologies that we use today, most of the refrigerating technologies, uh, ref refrigeration technologies that we use today, anything about smartphones, cell phones, GPS, um, touchpad screens, every kind of electronic equipment that we use in household items, uh, either were developed as part of military competition or space uh, race. So they're hugely uh, important. So essentially, I'm finishing today by giving a glimpse of the world in 1991, because we started this class with the world in 1914. 
1991, Soviet Union collapsed largely because of this arms race with the United States. Um, the economic models between communism and capitalism, uh, basically the question of which economic ideology, ideology is better for technological advancement, scientific advancement, and to run a modern state. That debate is still up in the air, but what we know is that the Soviet Union collapsed as a result of its competition with the United States. And in 1991, we have a unipolar world system in which there's only one superpower, United States. So let's have a look a little bit on why the Soviet Union collapsed. Iron Curtain fell. Over a dozen nations were finally freed from the heavy-handed grasp of the once powerful USSR. From its foundation in 1922 until its final demise in 1991, the Soviet Union and its allies made up an incredibly significant portion of Europe, essentially filling out the entire eastern side of the continent. A global superpower at its peak, the USSR somehow only lasted a short 70 years. How was this possible? And why exactly did the Soviet Union collapse? This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Join millions of players and fight area Let's with armor, weapon, a bit. and skills. What Skip I like about this game ad. is that I played in my childhood, as all. Yeah. And I'll okay. see you there. If you asked Gorbachev, the final president of the Soviet Union, why his nation and its collection of alliances crumbled before him, he would have one likely response, Chernobyl. The former president made it clear in 2006, 20 years after the nuclear meltdown occurred, that he truly believed this above all else was the final turning point into a steep decline for his Soviet Union. Whether this was the final straw or not for the Soviet people, it's no doubt that the Chernobyl tragedy was severely disastrous for the USSR. When the explosion occurred on April 26, 1986, the Soviet leadership immediately hoped to hide the startling problem from the people. It was evident from the start to the first responders and government officials that this explosion posed an enormous threat to the surrounding citizens, and the radioactive fallout it caused was roughly 400 times that of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. Yet still, the Communist Party was desperate to cover it all up. They gave no warning. And so May Day parades and other events continued to be held. Everyone went about their lives as normal, and no word was given. On May 14th, that President Gorbachev made his first public statement on the matter, during which he was very willing to downplay the reality of the failure and instead focus on bashing the West for what he called malicious lies and an over-exaggerated report of what had happened. It wasn't long before the truth came out, though, and the Soviet people became furiously aware of the corruption that they were under, and particularly the failure of Glasnost. Glasnost was a policy enacted by Mikhail Gorbachev that was supposed to restore certain freedoms for the Soviet people, such as freedom of speech, press, and religion. It was intended to create a better way of life and more transparency from the government, and in some ways, it did work. But the newfound freedoms allowed the Soviet people to discover the government cover-up efforts of Chernobyl and expose their leadership's deep corruption which led to a drastic decrease in public trust. This wasn't the only policy that would contribute to the Union's collapse, though. Another well-intended change was known as perestroika. The goal was to adopt a new economic system, similar to modern-day China. The mixed communist-capitalist structure would allow for more market freedom, and the policy also opens the door for new democratic elections. The Communist Party would still remain in control even with these elections, but the freedom of choice was nevertheless believed to be a significant benefit for the Soviet people. Ironically, though, this policy began to contribute to the crumbling of the Union, 
as citizens started to see the shifts as weaknesses. The reason why Perestroika was enacted may have also been a relevant factor to the Soviet collapse. Though it had previously been remarkably successful, the Soviet economy was now falling apart. There was a brief stint of recovery around 1970, but that was short-lived as the Afghanistan war became a new source of spending for the Soviet government. This greatly restrained the recovery path, and the citizens of the Union began to grow tired of living under a communist regime with poverty plaguing the people and communism seeming to be the cause, there was a severe need for change, which is what would lead Mikhail Gorbachev's later reforms. But as we know, this produced yet one more failed attempt to shave the shaky foundations the government were trying to stand on. The nail that sealed the coffin for the end of the Soviet Union was the events of 1989. After years of living under a Soviet shadow, the Warsaw Pact satellite states of the Union, including Poland, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia, began to face their own challenges and the downfall of Soviet-friendly regimes. Other nearby communist allies, such as Romania, also faced revolts that would sever their ties to the Communist Union, and the Berlin Wall over in Germany would once and for all be torn down. Ethnic conflict, anti-communist sentiments, and overall disapproval was building even from within the USSR itself, and instead of putting an end to it, the government, yet again, failed. The reason why there was even an opportunity for the opposition that rippled throughout the East in 1989 was due to a poor strategy utilized by President Gorbachev in his bid to resurrect the Soviet economy. After spending years as a frequent critic and enemy to the US, Gorbachev decided that the best way to create his successful economic reforms would be to build a better relationship with the West even though the United States particularly was still far from a potential friend for the Soviets. Hoping to calm these tensions as the first step toward friendship with the West, Gorbachev promised that the Soviet Union would withdraw from the nuclear arms race against the United States and even reduce their own military presence throughout the globe. Gorbachev decided to subsequently pull out of the Afghanistan war and reduce Soviet military presence throughout their satellite states. This sudden deterioration of an overbearing military throughout the Warsaw Pact nations and what appeared to be a weakening of international Soviet influence is what would trigger the following events of 1989. Still, it wasn't just the withdrawal of military troops that hurt the USSR, it was also the mere state of their military at the time. The Stalin-era policy that prioritized the production of military equipment over consumer goods and basic necessities for the Soviet people was no more, and with the economy tanking, Gorbachev's military was crumbling too. The consequences of his perestroika drastically reduced military spending and, in turn, the military might of the Union. There were also external factors, including an arms reduction treaty that the Soviets had tried to push off for as long as possible until 1988. This required the Union to cut its military numbers by 500,000, while roughly 15,000 of the troops over in Afghanistan had been killed. Pushback against the draft only worsened the problem, and once standing at over 5.3 million strong in 1985, the Soviet military was now reduced to a startling total below 2.7 million in 1991. With its people fighting back and an attempted coup by Communist Party opposition, Gorbachev's Soviet Union was in its final hours. On December 25th, 1991, President Mikhail Gorbachev announced to the world that the USSR was no more. This was the end of the Soviet Union altogether, as it could no longer withstand the weight of its mistakes. At 7.32 p.m., the flag of the Russian Federation 
rose in the place of the Soviet flag atop the Kremlin. The new president, Boris Yeltsin, would take the helm, now the leader of one nation, with 15 new neighbors who had once been joined together. We are now living in a new world, rang the words of the last president of the Soviet Union. The answer to why the Soviet Union collapsed may differ depending on who you ask. Gorbachev believes it was a result of Chernobyl, while others point to his own policies, perestroika and glasnost. Still, others blame the broken economy or decaying military. The reality is likely a sum of each of these theories. Without the economic chaos, perestroika would have not been necessary. If not for Glasnost, the Chernobyl scandal may have not been so easy to uncover. Furthermore, without Glasnost, drafted soldiers would have not been able to speak so openly about the despicable conditions they were forced into, and the military may have not shrunk so much. It also may have not been so dangerously reduced if Gorbachev had not been so extensively determined to begin appeasing the West. Or maybe, the Afghanistan war took too much of a toll on the military and the economy. More military spending and strength could have kept the satellite states in line and prevented the Berlin Wall from falling. Every potential reason for the dissolution of the USSR is intertwined with yet another reason. Even Gorbachev's theory of how his union fell apart is only a potential turning point, not the sole cause. The reality is that it took a series of mistakes and miscalculations to bring down the Soviet Union. And while it may be easy to blame the last president for destroying his own nation, it's important to note that a majority of his own mistakes were simply attempts to correct the flaws of his predecessors. In all actuality, the reason why the Soviet Union collapsed comes down to a long string of repeated failures on behalf of its leadership. Right. So this concludes this week's um, lecture. And um, next week, we're going to have our last um, lecture where we're going to focus more on modern um, technologies, how contemporary world politics are being, um, you know, changed as a result of it. So take care and i hope to see you next week in our final lecture so bye bye